I'm really interested in this presentation uh, to be delivered by Dr. Charles Milne, the Chief Veterinary Officer here in Victoria. He's going to talk to us about how likely is a sheep disease outbreak to occur in, in Victoria and is the livestock industry prepared to deal with such an event. And he's coming with um, very worldly experience in this space, um, both operationally and from a management uh, perspective in relation to the two foot and mouth disease outbreaks in Scotland. And we'll talk directly about those experiences during his presentation, um, providing a background on, on those experiences and touch on the likelihood and preparedness for um, that sort of disease out outbreak in the livestock industries in Victoria and particularly our ability to identify and eradicate that disease to preserve market access. And I, I imagine, I haven't heard um, Dr Milne speak, but I imagine that's, that's the essence of the story, certainly from a practical farmer perspective, is um, certainly perhaps confining and, if we can, eradicating any of those sort of outbreaks, but being able to maintain market access is, is obviously imperative for our businesses. So. Um, this biosecurity area is, is, is quite a challenge and, and I think we've got someone to speak to us about it that um, you know, knows as much as anyone. So um, welcome, Charles. Uh, thank you very much and uh, thank you very much for the invite to uh, speak tonight. Um, it's uh, quite an honour for an invasive pest like myself to be asked to talk to uh, an audience such as this. Um, I have to say also I was very excited at the thought of being introduced by Mr Trump because I thought if anyone's going to be more controversial than myself then uh, that was the person but uh, uh, there you go, that's where we live. Um, uh, yeah, I am going to talk about uh, uh, disease threats uh, to Victoria uh, in the context of experiences that I had uh, in the UK. Um, just to correct uh, a couple of points, I'm going to talk about three incidents of foot and mouth disease and only one of those occurred in Scotland because of some of the good work we did, but uh, we'll not score points at this stage of the evening. So let's see if, the, first of all, it works. Whoop, it does. So the first case I'm going to talk about was I was at uh, Veterinary College in 1981 and uh, we had an outbreak of uh, disease on the Isle of Wight. And uh, this was a disease outbreak in a herd of dairy cattle. Uh, we were able to identify the disease very quickly because the disease is very obvious in cattle. Uh, we were able to trace, there were only 20 animals that moved off the farm very quickly to uh, kill those animals and the disease didn't spread. Uh, so why were we able to do that? Well, the first thing was, and forgive this slide, it is from 1981, the first thing was we knew it was coming. So there was an outbreak of foot and mouth disease in northern France. Uh, and particularly in the pig industry. And there was a very big, big pig farm uh, in Normandy there, uh, at Brittany, I beg your pardon, beg, uh, pardon the French, uh, of some 10,000 pigs. Now, those of you who know about the virus know that pigs produce about 1,000 times more virus than cattle or sheep. They also produce a droplet size in their breath that floats on the wind. We were able to do meteorological modeling that suggested that the wind, uh, the wind was in the right direction to move the disease to the Isle of Wight, and you can see the, the model there. And sure enough, we were sitting waiting for it when it arrived. So uh, a lot of lessons for that. How would that apply um, here? Oh, it's very slow. Right, so here in Victoria, would we be prepared for a similar uh, scenario? Well, the first thing is, we're very lucky with our geography. We don't have countries nearby. 200 kilometers, which is how far the virus came across the channel, is probably uh, as far as the virus will go, but we're not gonna get uh, the virus introduced by that route. And because it was a disease in cattle, we've got fantastic traceability systems in cattle. We will be able to trace the disease uh, very quickly and hopefully get on top of it. We also have the ability to do similar meteorological mapping uh, in Australia. Uh, so again, we will be able to do the models and predict if it did come to the mainland where it might spread. But we do have a number of gaps in our traceability systems and our recording of picks that would, in, that would uh, hinder us in such an approach. <clears throat> hmm. So this is a little example of what we can do in Australia with the meteorological modelling. Uh, shortly after I arrived, I asked Canberra to actually uh, do an exercise from a pig farm in uh, uh, northern Grampians, similar size to the French farm, to see if we could actually do something similar. And we can, so that's really reassuring. Oop. We'll get there. 
But I talked about the picks. Um, this is a, a 10 kilometer circle around Lee and Gatha Market. I just chose it at random. You can see a lot of white uh, areas there of areas of land uh, which um, are not registered on the PIC system. And just a quick look at that, uh, uh, after I undertook that piece of work, uh, demonstrated that a lot of those farms actually contain livestock. So we don't have a good database of all the premises that keep livestock here in Victoria. So that's a weakness. So I'll move on now to uh, the, the incident that you all will have heard about, uh, if the machine will work. And that is 2001, uh, the outbreak uh, of foot and mouth, which was a major epi epidemic of disease. By that stage, uh, I'd qualified uh, from college. I'd uh, had two years in general practice, and I was then in the state veterinary service. Um, we, we hadn't had any uh, disease since 1981, and that was really insignificant. The reality is the previous biggest outbreak had been 67, 68. So there weren't a lot of people around still who'd had any experience of disease. The a disease was first identified in an abattoir. Um, it was one of our meat inspectors who brought it to the attention of the vet in, who was present in the abattoir. Uh, and the disease was confirmed the next day as foot and mouth disease. Now the problem was over 600 farms supplied that particular abattoir. And initially we found another couple of premises locally that were due to uh, movement of pigs um, from and to the abattoir and the movement of trucks that had spread disease. But actually, following back the 600 farms to the producers, we rapidly identified, uh, by concentrating on those people who fed swill, a premises in the north of England, some 480 kilometers away from the abattoir, uh, which had been originally infected. This is a gentleman who uh, had introduced the outbreak, Bobby Wolf. He was illegally feeding swill. At the time, it was legal to feed waste products to pigs, providing that they were boiled uh, for an, uh, at least an hour. Uh, he cut out that process and just fed raw material to pigs. So it was his pigs that started the whole outbreak off. By the time we got there, the disease had been present for probably close a month to a month, uh, and over 90% of his pigs were showing signs of disease. And if you remember to what I said back to the Isle of Wight uh, outbreak, pigs produce huge amounts of virus that become uh, airborne. So we did the modeling. You can see it's a lot more modern to, to the, uh, the slide from 1981. And we, yes, we saw there were some periods of time where there was a really high risk of spread. And indeed, um, we started uh, patrolling these farms, looking on the farms to see if the animals were infected. And Presswick Hall Farm, just to the north there, which was a sheep farm, uh, actually subsequently was identified with disease. So we started off with Bobby Wharf uh, heading on the wall. And then, around the 7th of February, the disease spread on the wind to the local sheep farm. This is where it starts to get interesting. Because on the 12th of uh, February, 16 sheep left that farm and went to Hexham Market, sale yard, locally. Uh, of those 16 sheep, nine went for slaughter, and seven sheep, and all the other animals that they had infected, uh, went on to Longton Market. Longton Market in the north of England uh, was the hub of all the movements of sheep coming out of the north of England and Scotland. And so there was a huge mixing of stock. Remember, we, didn't, we knew we had disease on the 20th of February. We're still talking about the 15th of February, so before we even knew we had a problem. By the time we knew we had a problem on the 20th, sheep from those at the uh, Longton Market had gone all over the UK. So, before we even knew we had a problem, we had over 200 farms infected. 12 different parts of the country, and in my part of the woods, neck of the woods, in Cumbria and southwest Scotland, we already had 100 farms infected before we knew we had a problem. Within those first three weeks, we had over 250 infected premises, uh, uh, over 1,100 report cases, so people were concerned that their animals had got disease, and we had all the tracing to do from the abattoir, from the farms, from the stock agents, from the sale yards. So we had over 9,300 jobs to do, just veterinary jobs in that first three weeks, and we had a veterinary service of 220 vets. The UK has about two and a half times the number of livestock that Victoria has. Um, we had 220 vets. In, here in Victoria, we have 26. So there's an issue of scale there for us here in Victoria. So this was my little neck of the woods where my operation was in southwest Scotland. This is Dumfries and Galloway. 
Um, I, on the 22nd of March, was sent down to southwest Scotland to undertake the three kilometre and contiguous coal. I was given one member of staff uh, and tasked with that operation. In two weeks, I had to build a team of 1,200 people. We slaughtered 520,000 sheep and 20,000 cattle and disposed of them all on the day of slaughter in those eight weeks. That was the size of the operation, so it was huge. Now, the reason I want to show this map is one of the key things that we had to do early on was actually trace the, the sheep coming out of uh, Longton Market that came to Scotland because they were the animals that were likely to seed disease. So we knew there was about 20 consignments came into the area of concern, but we only had a mob-based system. But it was a, strong, a reasonably strong mob-based system. Irrespective of that, it took us over three weeks to trace the animals in those 20 consignments because of the multiple movements that occurred. And I'll give you one example. So we had a, a, a local agent who was a bit of a rogue, and he bought sheep from uh, Longton Market. He then sold them down, down the road to another farm, who then subsequently sold them for, through Air Market, which is up to the north. Who should buy them at Air Market? None other than our original shady dealer. But did he tell us when we first visited him? No, he did not. Uh, we had to follow the whole circle on a paper exercise before we found they were back where they'd started. And what was worse, he actually sent those animals on to Northern Ireland in the interim while we were chasing so that uh, it actually disease was spread to Northern Ireland. So it took us three whole weeks just to trace 20 groups of animals at a time when they were potentially seeding disease. So some of the other issues uh, to talk about are uh, uh, disposal of stock. And uh, I put this slide up because initially we were using pyres to destroy animals. Uh, and it, it, to me, it illustrates the need for good communication. Because one of the bases of pyres, you need a good tunnel for, to get a good wind under the pyre to make it burn well. And for that, we use railway sleepers. Very quickly, we used up all of the railway sleepers in the UK. So a civil servant down in Whitehall was charged with go out and get some railway sleepers. So off to Canada he went and he, he bought a load of railway sleepers and they duly arrived at Liverpool docks. Uh, only when they were unloaded were they found to be concrete railway sleepers. <laughs> because, because no one told him what they were for. Um, so which does illustrate the need to actually be very clear of the purpose of what you're uh, asking for. So, so the, the other thing I thought that some of you entrepreneurs would be interested in is uh, the work we very rapidly went on to burial of uh, a sheep. And this is our, our site in Dumfries and Galloway, uh, Berkshire Forest. We buried some 500,000 sheep there. And then in this one pit alone, there was about 400,000 sheep. So why do I say uh, entrepreneurs will be interested? Well, the local farmer we bought this site from, we bought the site for $2 million. And following remediation of the site, we sold it back for $2. So there's money to be made, guys. Um, the, re the reason why we were so keen uh, to buy that land was Dumfries and Galloway uh, is, is underrun by aquifers that are used by private boreholes. So we, it, there was very few areas we could bury. This site was triple lined. The engineering was incredible. And to this day, some 15 years later, we're still managing the effluent coming off that site. So it's a long-term uh, uh, policy to do uh, work like that. But again, just to illustrate the size and the speed of the operation, we bought that uh, piece of land off uh, the farmer, and within 24 hours, we'd felled the forest, we'd driven the metal road in two kilometers, and we dug our first pit in 24 hours. That is the speed that the operation that you need to undertake for a disease like this. So it's a very serious um, operation all round, not just in terms of the impact on farming. So what about Victoria in a scenario like that? Well, if we got in in sheep, the real problem is, unlike cattle, you really don't pick up clinical symptoms in sheep very easily. So it's quite possible that if it first developed in sheep, that we would have widespread dissemination of disease before we even knew we had a problem. One of the big lessons of 2001 was we'd actually lost track of what our industry was doing. We didn't understand the movements. We didn't know there was so much movement going through long-term market. Uh, so we've done a lot of work subsequently in the UK to understand that. And now we're doing the same sort of work in Victoria. And this Friday, I'm looking forward to a presentation on the sheep industry and the movements that, that we currently undertake in Victoria to try and get a better understanding of where the risk points are. 
Our traceability systems in sheep uh, in, in uh, Australia are very poor. Don't kid yourself, they are poor. They're not even as good as the UK had in 2001. And the reason for that is uh, the UK farmers tend to be more compliant, not because they're any more law-abiding than any other farmers anywhere else in the world, but we do have an advantage. UK farmers get this thing called subsidy. And even a small farm will get $25,000 a year, and some of the big farms will get well over a million dollars a year. But if they don't obey the law, then that subsidy is cut quite in quite draconian ways. So there is an incentive to comply, and by and large, people did. But the system was still slow. And I would argue uh, the system here in Victoria is as slow, if not slower. National movement restrictions. We put in place a national movement stance in the UK for the first time, and that really did slow down the disease, and it would work here. But there are huge consequences for industry when your livestock are locked up. And you really need to think ahead about how you would manage that. For some, for some at some times of the year with sheep, it's not too difficult. They can stay in the pasture. For pig farmers and farmers with intensive animals, if you can't move your stock, they continue to breed, they continue to grow, you can't even move them to slaughter, you soon run into huge welfare problems. And one of the big lessons to us was the people who got disease, yes, it was hard, and it, was huge, it had a huge psychological impact, and it was very difficult, but they were well compensated. The people in the areas under restrictions who didn't get disease, they had all the stress of, are we going to get it? All the stress of the market collapse got no compensation. Ended up with animals that were, had very low values, they were over fat, they'd had to pay for feed. So uh, economic impact is not always where you think it will be. And the other thing you have to understand is international markets will take a long time to open. The UK really doesn't have a huge export market and is protected to a degree by the EU because when you're in the EU, and who knows what's going to happen on Thursday, um, uh, when you're in the EU, if, if the Commission says you're free to trade, everybody's got to trade with you. They have no choice. We're not in that position here in Australia. It's up to the importing countries whether they'll trade or not. And we are far more reliant on exports than the UK ever was. So I think the, you know, the risk from uh, market closure is huge. It took us seven years to get back into China. Now, okay, for the UK, China's not a really important market, and we will put a lot more effort if I'm here in Australia to reopen that market, but it will be years. It will not be a question of a month or two. And, the, and, and the, one of the big lessons for us, too, is the uh, economic and social impact was far wider than just the farming industry. So tourism in the UK took a bigger financial hit than farming did. And it affected everybody in the community, from school children, some of the schools locally, they needed counselling for the school kids for two years after the event, all the way through to the agricultural players, uh, but small businesses too. So, so the impact is huge. Hopefully, it'll move forward again. So, last uh, outbreak that I was involved, by this time I was Chief Veterinary Officer in Scotland. Um, and, very embarrassingly, um, the outbreak was caused by the escape of a virus from uh, the Purbright World Reference Laboratory for foot and mouth disease. Huge embarrassment for the government. The only um, excuse we've got is it didn't actually escape from the research and the diagnostic facility. It was actually this in the top, bottom right-hand corner, the merry old French company, of course, uh, vaccine uh, facility. Um, what actually happened here, and again it illustrates the real risk of this disease, is um, there, there was remediation of uh, the site, they were, they were upgrading the site, and uh, they dug up the drains that drained this place. Now there shouldn't have been any live virus in the, in the drains, but there was. So the, the mechanical diggers dug up the site and created mud and all over the, uh, the, the, the place, and there were some trucks drove in to deliver some material, and they drove off 20 kilometers down the road carrying mud on the tires. And some of that mud fell off about 20 kilometers away against a field, uh, in a field uh, in which cattle were kept and the cattle picked up disease. So again, it illustrates foot and mouth it isn't just animals that transfer it. It isn't just the wind. Your shoes, your clothes, your machinery can transmit disease. So a real lesson there. So in this case, we only had eight outbreaks of foot and mouth disease. And there's two groups there. So just watch those dates. There were two early on in uh, August, and then we had a break until the 12th of September. Remember the 12th of September. So we only had eight. We only lost 1,500 animals, as opposed to six and a half million animals were killed in 2001. Um, and very few sheep involved, which was good news. 
By that time, we had fantastic traceability in sheep and good traceability in cattle because in the interim from 2001 to 2007, the EU said we're not subbing the UK again for foot and mouth disease. We're going to introduce legal requirement for electronic traceability of sheep. So we could trace sheep. Now, I've given you an example of cattle here, but the green premises were uh, premises in England, in southeast England near Purbright, and then the black premises uh, was in northern England, and all the red premises were in Scotland. Funnily enough, we had about 20 consignments of cattle and sheep coming out of southeast England, similar to the 20 consignments of sheep in 2001. Within 24 hours, I knew where every animal had gone to in Scotland. I'd been able to get vets on farm to clinically examine the animals and reassure ourselves we didn't have disease. And on the back of that, we were able to produce risk maps. Those black dots that you can see on the maps are the farms that actually received animals from southeast England. And we were able then to map out where the high risk areas were in Scotland where we could have disease. We're able also to look at sale yard. So unlike the system here, um, we have huge ram sales at certain times of the year uh, where most of the rams are sold. Uh, they are obviously huge congrega uh, congregations of animals where if there had been disease, the spread would have been uh, huge. And we were able to take real life data to actually plot where the risk of disease spread would have been if the animals had been infected. And one of the really good things uh, that I was able to do on the back of this is with all this analysis that we're able to do because we knew what we were dealing with, I was able to say, what was the risk of there being a farm in Scotland that was infected I didn't know anything about? And as you can see from this graph, very quickly, I was able to say the risk had reduced to nil. Now, I didn't lift restrictions, uh, national movement restrictions in Scotland straight away. I left it about a week. I left it till the 11th of September. Remember back to 12th of September? I was confident we didn't have any disease. We'd done all the work, we'd done the epidemiology. We were confident. I informed the UK CVO I was going to lift restrictions in Scotland, which caused a political storm in Westminster. Why can Scotland lift and England can't? So England was ordered to lift without doing the work. Uh, and the CVO went on the television at 6 o'clock on the 11th and said, I'm confident we don't have foot and mouth disease in the UK. The next morning, she was on the same BBC channel saying, at 9 o'clock, I'm confirming the next case of foot and mouth disease. Um, there was nothing funny about that for her. There was nothing funny about it for the country, but it illustrated the point that you need the information, you need to have the evidence to lift uh, a restriction safely. So, what are the lessons for us here in Victoria if we have uh, something similar? Well, the first good news is we don't do any live virus work in, in, in uh, Australia for foot and mouth disease. It's not even at CSIRO at all. So, uh, we're, we're safe from that perspective. Do we understand current uh, keeper practices in Victoria? Well, Friday I'll find out. So that's uh, something that we can uh, certainly learn uh, too. Our traceability of sheep, I come back to it, is poor. Now, I'll give you an example of how I know it's poor uh, with a contemporary example. So most of you have heard that we've had a little incident with Japan recently, uh, which has resulted in the exports of cattle being banned. Um, we got a request from the Japanese CVO that we actually traced all 300 animals uh, that formed part of that consignment. The consignment came from Victoria. Uh, within 24 hours, we'd able to trace every premises that every one of those animals had been on in their lives. There were over 600 of them. Uh, and we knew the disease status of every one of those farms in 24 hours. At the same time, same day, funnily enough, we started doing the sheep catcher two exercise to test how effectively our, effective our sheep tracing uh, is in uh, Australia. Victoria was allocated 14 sheep, not 300, 14 sheep. We estimate it's going to take us over 30 days to trace those 14 sheep, and we still won't have the level of confidence that we have with those 300 cattle after 24 hours. That is a very real current example. So, uh, we're also working on building the epidemiological networks in Victoria, um, which uh, uh, are similar to the, will allow us to do the work similar to the UK, which will do the assessment in case we get a disease. And it doesn't have to be foot and mouth disease. Um, and again, I go back to the point that international markets take a long time to open uh, once they're closed. Don't just think we're talking about when we come to trace, but it's just disease. Um, recently, Singapore identified kumatetralil in pig liver, uh, in pigs export, or pig products exported from Australia. 
Cumatetralil is a rat poison, um, and it's a second generation warfarin derivative. Again, we were able to trace the products back to the farms of origin. So it could be residues, could be welfare. Vietnam's another example recently. All good reasons why we need to trace product back to the farm of origin and have confidence. And without that, we cannot maintain market access. And as Mr. Trump very rightly said, this is all about market access. Yeah, hopefully, we can move on to the next slide. Right. Now, some of these figures you'll have seen before. So what does a foot and mouth outbreak mean in Australia? Well, Abair has actually suggested that uh, an outbreak, a medium-sized outbreak of foot and mouth disease would cost the economy over $50 billion over the next 10 years. So this is something serious to worry about. We know that prevention is better than cure. Um, our quarantine systems are strong. We need to guard those jealously. Um, we need to ensure that the rules are enforced, not only at the borders, but the feeding of swill to pigs is a very real risk, and uh, often imported meat products could contain virus. That certainly was the case in the UK in 2001, and also in 2000 when we had an outbreak of uh, classical swine fever. Early detection is critical, um, so you, the farmers, play a huge role in reporting suspect disease. Just today, I got negative results, you'll ple be pleased to hear, from a farmer who had reported a suspect case of foot and mouth disease. We like to see reports. If in any day, report, because I'd far rather than have too many and rule them out than miss the one that is the start of the outbreak. National movement standstills will work, um, but it will be uh, painful, and it is reliant on you guys in this room to make it work. We can't enforce it fully. We can't watch everybody all the time. If you want to move animals around the state uh, under the radar, well, it's your industry you're putting at risk. Um, we really need everybody to play their part. And as I keep on going on about traceability being an essential tool. So many of these figures, you're far more expert than me uh, in terms of what the sheep industry in Victoria me, uh, is worth, but it is very significant. And I go back to the fact that it is entirely dependent uh, in terms of price on the export market. And this just illustrates that over the last few years, there's a correlation between the uh, price that is paid in sale yards and the amount of lamb that's exported. If we lost our export market, the price of lamb would plummet. What's happening in the dairy industry at the moment will pale into significance compared to the price impact uh, of market closure. Finally, just to let you know that uh, everything in the garden isn't doom and gloom. Uh, last year, funnily enough, just with a new government, it was very helpful. We had a really hot suspect foot and mouth disease um, uh, and uh, on the 28th of January. And subsequently, we ran a, uh, an exercise looking at similar to the starburst maps to, to that I showed you in the Scottish uh, RAM sale. Uh, the blue movements are movements into sale yards, and the red movements are movements out of sale yards. But again, it just illustrates, potentially, if a sale yard became infected with disease, how widespread the disease could come very, very quickly. And just to finish, there is humor in an outbreak. This is a newspaper cartoon. For those of you who are familiar with Winnie the Pooh, you'll know that piglet was the only foot and mouth susceptible species. So thank you very much. Okay, we're open, open for questions. And um, the scoring system has him two nil, like two, and I'm nil. So I'm, I'm, I haven't quite got my comeback yet. But uh, Darren, you have a question for Charles. And we, we will repeat the question because it's being recorded. So, uh, but no, um, our staff went to Western Australia to participate in that exercise, a really valuable exercise, and we will obviously be watching the learning points with interest. We work very closely with other states. Um, we share a lot of our learnings with, with uh, other states, and we learn from them. So uh, next uh, Wednesday, uh, I'm going up to Queensland. They're uh, actually giving a presentation of all the work that they've been doing on foot and mouth preparedness over the last couple of years. So uh, will we ever be prepared? No, we won't. Uh, but can we be as well prepared as we can? Yes, we can. And uh, by working with each other, we can make the resources that we have available go a lot further. So the question is, hypothetically, what can go wrong? Um, look, every outbreak that I've ever been involved with is different to, to the previous one. And things happen uh, that you just don't predict. So I'll give you an example of a real-life situation. We had an outbreak of highly pathogenic avian influenza in uh, um, Bury St Edmunds, and we were setting up an incident control centre. And the first thing that happened is the council were repairing, uh, had a digger out, digging a hole, and they went through the main telephone cable to the town. So all telephone, now if you'd written that into an exercise, 
uh, people would say foul. It's never going to happen. Um, the, just from the three outbreaks that I showed you in foot and mouth disease, they're completely different every time. So the, the key thing is to have a really good capability, to have well-trained staff, to have exercise with all the key uh, players who are going to have an important role to play, so industry, other government agencies, local councils, uh, government itself, um, making sure that you've got the contacts, making sure that you've got the contracts in place that you'll need for uh, machinery, for uh, uh, personnel, uh, and just um, in, in May at the OIE, which is the World Animal Health Organization meeting in, in Paris, Mark Shipp, our Australian CVO, um, signed a, a, a renewed international agreement to access veterinary services uh, in the event of a foot and mouth outbreak. So an international reserve is out there. Um, will we ever be prepared? As I say, you can never be prepared for the big one because you just cannot resource any, any uh, service to cope with that large event. But what you can do is make sure that we are linked in to all the uh, resources you need. And we're really lucky here. I mean, one of the things I've been really impressed with since I've arrived is, you know, the emergency management Victoria and the systems that we've got in place, often because of fire and other emergencies. Well, we've got those networks. We've got that expertise that'll be there to support us in the event of a big, uh, you know, animal disease outbreak. The question is, what could Victoria put in place to be perfect? Well, look, I'm, I'm, I make no uh, bones about the fact that I think our traceability systems need improving. Our cattle are strong, and it, but it's not as good as it could be because we need to do more work on enforcement. Sheep is definitely weak, and we need to work on that. I think um, uh, in a lot of other areas, we've got a huge amount of strength. Um, we've done a lot of pre uh, preparation. Uh, we have got networks that will be effective, uh, and we, we can pull resources in. Um, there is a constant challenge for us in terms of capability, ensuring that we, we have turnover of staff, ensuring that the staff that we have are uh, trained and capable. And that's just not our veterinary and animal health officer staff. So we were having an exercise on Monday, and we were talking about if we had a national movement uh, standstill, um, we'd be asking the police and uh, Vic Rhodes to shut the borders with New South Wales and South uh, Australia. So having all of these organizations fit and ready to work would be my utopia. Um, we actually briefed the executive board of DDJTR not, not, not long ago, because again, the other government departments, the other parts of governments have a huge role to play here. Chief health officer has a huge role to play. He needs to get out there and say, meat safe to drink, uh, safe to eat, milk, milk safe to drink. It is not a zoonotic disease. Um, so my utopia is that everybody knows what they have to do, and we have the systems that enable us to operate. And that takes constant work. So the second question could take an hour and a half to answer, but uh, I'll start on the first question, which is, I will repeat it. And, um, uh, the first question is, uh, Australia has a lot of feral animals um, and the UK didn't. Well, just a, a point of interest, uh, we had a lot of uh, red deer and uh, roe deer in the area. And indeed, we had a lot of um, uh, supposedly wild boar. Uh, in the area um, as well, so feral pigs. Um, it, they were significant in terms of the outbreak. We had to understand what role they, they would play. Now, the important thing with the species of deer that we have in the UK is that they can become infected, they get very sick, they get very sore feet, they don't move about, and they recover and don't become carriers. So the worst thing you can do is go in and shoot them because you chase them all over the countryside. So we actually chose not to gull the deer, and afterwards we did some serious surveillance to make sure they were free. The pigs, uh, we shot a few pigs, um, and indeed we had some goats too. Uh, we shot some goats and pigs and looked at the uh, serology, and they were all free of disease. So again, they weren't significant. Now, um, in terms of the ferals in Australia, um, we need to understand, so there are a number of deer species and they operate in a different way. So some are like the UK species, that so they can become infected and they rapidly clear infection and they're not really significant. Other species can actually become carriers, so they become more significant. We are actually funding some research projects at the moment to try and understand what the distribution of uh, deer and pigs is. But more importantly, what's their interaction with livestock? Because if, if um, a deer and pigs are in an area but there is no contact with the livestock, then the risk is very low. And the example for that really in the Australian context is uh, the absolutely amazing uh, TB eradication program that was undertaken here, where the two wild species were of concern were buffalo and pigs. Pigs were a dead-end host, so not significant. They didn't transmit disease, and uh, buffalo just didn't come into contact with the cattle, so they're irrelevant. So we need to understand the species when there is an outbreak, what the contact is and what the relevance are, and afterwards, 
it, it will be important to prove and demonstrate uh, that your wildlife and your, uh, your, your feral population are not infected going forward yet. So the second question was about why can't we have a vaccine for foot and mouth disease? Well, we do. Um, but uh, there are seven strains of foot and mouth disease and the vaccines are not cross-protective. That's the first thing to understand. The second thing to understand and, and is that um, un unlike rabies, which is probably the best vaccine known to man, um, foot and mouth disease vaccine is not 100% protective. So the worst thing you can have is a disease slowly cycling. The other thing is it doesn't stop animals necessarily becoming infective, uh, infective and infectious. The third thing that is really significant is that um, you've got to be able to tell after an outbreak which animals are suffering from disease and which have been vaccinated. So you've got to have what you call a DIVA test, a differentiation between infected and vaccinated animals, and they are not precise enough to differentiate. And to use an example of where that's absolutely destroyed a country's uh, export trade is Taiwan. Taiwan had a big outbreak uh, in pigs. Um, they were a massive exporter of pork. They chose to vaccinate, and for three years afterwards, they were picking up non-structural um, protein positives in their pigs, indicating the presence of virus, not vaccine. They were false positives, but who in the world is going to trade with them? So they went from a major exporter of pork to actually a net importer of pork. So now the other thing I will, I mean, I could go on vaccine for hours, but the, 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 the other thing that's really important is we tried to vaccinate in Cumbria in 2001 because the cattle were inside and we were worried the pastures were contaminated and they were going to be turned out and we wanted to dampen the disease down. So we proposed a vaccination program. The retailers said, you vaccinate those cattle and we'll never sell any meat or milk from those animals in perpetuity. At which point the farmer said, don't want to go there. So the public acceptability of the product is important too. Now we've done a lot of work uh, subsequently with the supermarkets and they now say they will take uh, products from vaccinated animals, but in an outbreak, if their consumers don't want it, they'll just turn like that. So vaccination is extremely complex. The other thing is we do have a reserve of vaccine. Australia has a vaccine bank and we actually uh, uh, buy that vaccine based on risk. So with our trading partners and geographical risk, um, and we hold that. Now, um, we only have enough in that bank to vaccinate a very small population of animals. To actually get to vaccinate all the animals in Victoria uh, will probably take three or four months for the vaccine supply to arrive, by which time the disease is either beaten or it's gone. So if we had a small focus of disease, um, then we would have enough vaccine to put a ring vaccination around it and potentially con uh, contain it. Then we would look, oops, sorry, then we'd look to slaughter those animals so we could get trading uh, quicker again. Because currently the rules are you can recommend trade three months after a slaughter policy, but six months after a vaccination policy. So it does add delay to the system. So for all these reasons, vaccine is an incredibly complicated subject. <laughs> So we could vaccinate it. My dream, if you talk about utopia, my dream would be a single vaccine that covered all seven strains of the disease, that a single dose protected for life, and then we'd have a situation where we could eradicate the disease worldwide like we have with Rinderpest. Yeah. So, so, so that's a, a very pointed question. So, um, look, it depends on the scenario. If, 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 if um, we had a hobby farmer who... Uh, uh, fed swill to his, his, his pigs and uh, was very sharp and he, he picked up that the pigs were sick and reported them very quickly and we stamped it out before it was spread, then, then the, the, the traceability systems um, are less important. There would be a restrictions on movements, but we would be able to lift them fairly quickly. If we got anything more widespread in the sheep population, um, there's, we, we just would have no confidence that we understood where the disease had been. And so um, that would have a number of uh, uh, consequences. Firstly, the national movement stance would have to stay on a lot longer. We would have to leave it on for two or three incubation periods. An incubation period in the OIE is 14 days. So we would have to leave a standstill until we were absolutely certain that there, had, there was no more spread and we, any animals that had got disease had either been identified or had recovered. The other thing that would be really difficult would be opening up uh, international markets. We would be heavily audited before countries would allow us to trade with them again. And uh, the understanding is that we have traceability systems and, uh, and that they're robust. Now, interesting enough, just this week, 
um, the USA have appointed a new chief veterinary officer and he was making an observation about um, their, their traceability system. And he was saying his main goal as chief veterinary officer was to get effective traceability. He said uh, the Chinese had just banned exports of cattle from uh, America because they didn't have confidence in their traceability systems. And he went on the record publicly and said, until we have the confidence that our traceability systems are robust enough to stand up to external audit, we will never have a stable international trading base. Well, we've just been audited, funnily enough. Um, by the, uh, so the question was, would the Australian system stand up to external audit? So we've just been audited by the OAE, um, which is the international, uh, it's the World Animal Health Organization. Uh, Australia scored very well, there's 47 categories and we've scored the top score in 38 categories. So a fantastic uh, outcome, far better than any other country uh, audited so, uh, so far. We are the first of the advanced countries to undertake that audit, so we would expect to do well, but we've done very well. That said, one of the things that they did flag up in that report is that our sheep systems, our sheep traceability systems are not robust and we need to strengthen them. So the question is, uh, and I'll learn to repeat them, the question is where are the, uh, the biggest risks of the disease coming into the country? So the biggest risk to my mind is the uh, illegal feeding of waste food to uh, pigs. There are an awful lot of hobby farmers out there who think that the green thing to do is to uh, uh, is to feed waste food to their pigs because they're saving the environment. In fact, there was a Green Senator who actually published an article in the uh, Sunday uh, Age suggesting that he was feeding uh, swill to his pigs in Victoria. Um, he's not doing that anymore, I can hasten uh, to, to, to add. Um, um, uh, however, uh, that to me is the biggest single risk because um, the virus can uh, uh, survive very effectively in meat products. Um, now, one of, the, one of the big lessons for us, uh, just a bit of anecdotal stuff in the UK, 67, 68 outbreak, how did that occur? That occurred because a farmer's wife went down to the local butcher, she bought a leg of lamb that was sourced from South America. She went back to the farm, she boned it out, she gave the bone to the farm a dog who went out and sat in the, the yard with all the dairy cattle and chewed the bone and uh, the virus was in the, in the bone. That changed world trade because in muscle, the virus will be uh, killed very quickly by rigor mortis, the ac acidification of uh, 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 during rigor mortis, but in bones, in the marrow of the bones, the virus is protected. So now, from countries with disease, uh, bone in meat is banned. That's why you see the adverts on the telly every Christmas for pork, buy pork with bone in because it's Aussie. Any pork coming from outside Australia will not have bones in because it's a protective measure. But meat products, salami, pies, can carry that virus live in them for a long period of time. You feed those to animals. So that's the top risk. The second risk is with increasing uh, movements of people, um, this virus is prevalent all around the world and you can carry it in the back of your throat. You won't get infected, but you can carry it for three or four days in the back of your throat quite happily. You can bring it in on your shoes, you can bring it in on your clothes. So anybody actually visiting uh, Nepal or China or India and they're going out in agricultural environments, if they come back, uh, and that virus on your shoes can last a lot longer, it can last weeks. If they come back and they don't, uh, don't clean their shoes, disinfect their shoes and their clothes, or launder their clothes and go onto a farm where there are susceptible livestock, then they could very easily introduce disease. So, uh, and that's not even down to Johnny Depp, that's just uh, a, a good old homegrown uh, Aussie person. So that's the second risk to me. Three, three or no? Ah, uh, yeah, I was only gonna stick at three. The, the other risk is, um, Deliberate introduction, which is a, you know, it is a real uh, a, a risk. Um, this is a virus that you could very easily bring into the country if you chose to. Uh, and again, that's why um, our border security is really important. So the question is, why would Victoria go it alone on any system? Um, I suppose, why does anyone do the right thing? Um, and then I suppose, uh, I certainly don't want to uh, try and teach Australian history, for which I'm not familiar, but uh, I would say the lesson of cattle was a good one. Uh, Victoria, as I understand it, went first with cattle and very quickly the rest of the country followed. So um, my, my own view is uh, we need to protect uh, our 
producers and protect their markets. Uh, and if that means we need to go ahead of other parts of the country, this is my personal view, uh, whether it's traceability or uh, disease control or biosecurity, then we need to put in place the systems that are, are required. Yes, it's great if we can go nationally. Uh, it would be wonderful to do everything nationally. But, uh, you know, even in the UK with only four countries, um, that was a really difficult ask. And here we've got more states and territories than the UK. So there are always going to be differences. Um, should we always go at the pace of the slowest? I, you know, I'm not a great proponent of that. So um, we know that our minister has already said that she sees the, um, uh, the introduction of electronic ID in time as inevitable. There's no time uh, attached to that. I think a lot of industry people will say that they recognize that the system needs to be tightened. Um, uh, I think it's, there needs to be a, a very mature debate um, recognizing that the only reason we're doing this, this isn't, I'm not, you know, this is to protect the industry against risk. It's not being introduced so we can keep an eye on you or anything like that. It is to manage very real risks of disease, residues, welfare, all the things that can hit us at any time without warning. And, and look, uh, you know, you can say, why come from the UK and tell us you didn't introduce it before you had a problem? That's absolutely right. And uh, we didn't. But, you know, had we done so, why do we always have to wait for the big thing to go wrong until we actually take some action? Would it not be better that we were proactive and actually put in, places, uh, put in place mitigation of risk before uh, we, we got an event that we all regretted? Okay, so the question is, uh, do I think the departments across uh, this as is an issue? Um, well, uh, as I understand it, and there are others in the room who could maybe talk better than, uh, uh, about this than me, but one of the reasons that I was employed in this particular role was the experience that I could bring to Victoria. Um, Victoria, the, 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 um, uh, you know, the huge amount of effort has been put into Victoria in terms of preparation. Um, there have been massive investment through uh, government-funded programs. And uh, just in this current budget round, an extra $20.6 million has been allocated to biosecurity. So, so yes, I think there is a commitment in the department uh, to address this. Everybody I've spoken to is um, uh, from the executive down, um, is committed to making things work. We've got new emergency management procedures in place that recognize the threats of animal disease, human disease, floods, as well as the, the, the traditional fires. So we, I think we have the infrastructure, we have a huge commitment within the department. Um, and are we across it? As I've said before, we're never going to be across it. It needs constant work, um, a constant investment to make sure we're as best prepared as we possibly can. And it's not just about one issue like traceability. It's about the preparation and all of the other areas that I've said about how do we destroy animals? How do we put in place some national movement restriction? How do we reopen markets as quickly as possible? All this work's going on in parallel both by government, but I, also, but I also recognize there's a huge amount of work being done by industry too. So recovery was long and hard. So th 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 there's lots of different categories. So the people who got disease, I explained before, their animals were slaughtered, they were well compensated for those animals, but they couldn't go back into production straight away. They had to cleanse and disinfect. Uh, then there had to be a reintroduction policy and because there was a shortage of animals in the UK, uh, they had to take what they could get. So breeding lines were not as good, the genetics were not as good, and they also introduced uh, diseases that hadn't been present on the farm before. So BVD, uh, Yoni's disease, uh, spread around the country like there was no tomorrow. So for those people who got disease, there was a quite a long-standing on impact. They got the value of the animals, um, but not the ongoing loss. The people who did have uh, animals and they weren't slaughtered, um, their losses were considerable um, because they had to keep the animals for longer. There were no markets. The value of those animals fell hugely and there was no compensation for them. Now, one of the things that we, we did both in 2001 and 2007 was we actually ran what we call welfare schemes where we actually uh, bought animals that had no market off the farmers. And it was very clear we paid below the market rate so we didn't generate a market in supplying the, 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 the destruction scheme, if you like. In, in, uh, I mentioned that six and a half million animals were killed in uh, 2001. Four and a half million of them were killed for disease control purposes. Two million were killed because there were no markets. So farmers took a big hit in terms of low value. Now, that went on for a period of time, but as I say, we're working within the EU, our markets reopened fairly quickly. I think in the Australian context, firstly, we're hugely more reliant on exports. 
you know, we exported a tiny percentage of, of what we produce. In Victoria, way over half of what's produced in the animal sector is exported. So our market's going to collapse. If you've got no, no way of selling your product and uh, you're still in a massive oversupply, the domestic market will collapse. And that will go on for a long period of time. There's no guarantee that markets will open straight away. The very best case scenario, if everything went right, if we had that single one tiny little farm and we got on top of it really quick, the very best scenario that you could do is a six month reopener markets, but that is never going to happen. You, the markets are going to be closed for at least a year, and I would guess probably two years or more for some countries. Countries are very, very fearful of introduction of this disease because of its devastating impact. So how much will it cost? Um, there is a calculation, Abares has done the calculation that's come up with this 50 billion figure. You can go into that piece of work. I was, funnily enough, I was looking at it online this morning, um, just looking for a, a, a figure. Uh, and it actually sets out the various different categories of loss. So, so you could actually get that figure from there. But um, suffice to say, it will be deep and it'll be long lasting and it will not just be farmers. It's all those support industries, the feeds, the, the, the machinery people, uh, you know, the local shops, um, they'll all suffer because the money won't be there in the rural economy. Yeah. All right. We might um, bring it to a close there. If on we that cheerful note. On that cheerful note. Um, <laughs> Dr Charles Milne, thank you very much for updating us on biosecurity. Area.